The Sunday after the Saturday already described proved to be as bright as the weatherman had predicted. When putting the breakfast things back on the chair outside my room for my good landlady to remove at her convenience, I gleaned the following situation by listening from the landing across which I had softly crept to the banisters in my old bedroom slippers. The only old things about me. There had been another row. Mrs. Hamilton had telephoned that her daughter was running a temperature. Mrs. Hayes informed her doctor that the picnic would have to be postponed. Hot little Hayes informed big cold Hayes that if so, she would not go with her to church. Mother said, very well, I left. I had come out on the landing straight after shaving, soapy earlobed, still in my white pajamas with the cornflower blue, not the lilac, design on the back. I now wiped off the soap, perfumed my hair and armpits, slipped on a purple silk dressing gong and humming nervously, went down the stairs in quest of low. I want my learned readers to participate in the scene I am about to replay. I want them to examine, examine its every detail and see for themselves how careful, how chaste the whole wine sweet event is if viewed with what my lawyer has called in a private talk we have had impartial sympathy. So let us get started. I have a difficult job before me. Main charter, Humbert the Hammer. Time, Sunday morning in June. Place, sunlit living room. Props, old candy stripped Davenport, magazines, phonograph, Mexican knickknacks, uh, the late Mrs. Mr. Harold E. Hayes, God bless the good man, had engendered my darling at the siesta hour in a blue washed room on a honeymoon trip to Veracruz, and mentos among these Dolores were all over the place. She wore that day a pretty print dress that I had seen on her once before, ample in the skirt, tight in the bodice, short-sleeved, pink, checkered with darker pink, and to complete the color scheme she had painted her lips and was holding in her hollowed hands a beautiful banal eaten red apple. She was not shot, however, for church, and her white Sunday purse lay discarded near the phonograph. My heart beat like a drum as she sat down, cool skirt ballooning subsiding on the sofa next to me, and played with her glossy fruit. She tossed it up into the sun-dusted air and caught it it made a capped, polished plop. Humbert, Humbert, intercepted the apple. Get back, she pleaded, showing the marbled flash of her palms. I produced delicious. She grasped it and beat into it, and my heart was like snow under this uh, under thin, thin, thin crimson skin, and with the monkeyish nimbleness that was so typical of that American infant, she snatched out of my abstract grip the magazine I had opened. Pity no film had recorded the curious pattern, the monogramic linkage of our simultaneous or overlapping moves. Rapidly, hardly hampered by the disfigured apple she held, Low flipped violently through the pages in search of something she wished Humbert to see. Found it at last. I faked interest by bringing my head so close that her hair touched my temple and her arm brushed my cheek as she wiped her lips with her wrist. Because of, her, because of the burnished mist through which I peered at the picture, I was slow in reacting to it, and her bare knees rubbed and knocked impatiently against each other. Dimly there came into view, a surrealist painter relaxing, souping on a beach, and near him, likewise souping, a plaster replica of the Venus di Milo, half buried in sand. Picture of the week, said the legend. I whisked, I whisked the whole obscene thing away. Next moment, in a sham effort to retrieve it, she was all over me. Caught her by her thin, knobby wrist, 
The magazine escaped to the floor like a flustered fowl. She twisted herself free, recoiled, and lay back in the right-hand corner of the Davenport. Then, with perfect simplicity, the impudent child extended, extended her legs across my lap. By this time, I was in a state of excitement bordering on insanity. But I also had the cunning of the insane. Sitting there on the sofa, I managed to attune by a series of stealthy movements, my mask lashed into her guileless limbs. It was no easy matter to divert the little maiden's attention while I performed the obscure adjustments, adjustments necessary for the success of the trick. Talking fast, lagging behind my own breath, catching up with it, mimicking a sudden toothache to explain the breaks in my patter, and all the while Keeping a maniac's inner eye on my distant golden goal, I cautiously increased the magic friction that was doing away, in an illusional if not factual sense, with the physically irremovable but psychologically verifiable texture of the material divide, pajamas and robe, between the weight of two sunburnt legs resting athwart my lap and the hidden tumor of unspeakable passion. Having, in the curse of my patter, hit upon something nicely mechanical, I recited, garbling them slightly, the words of a foolish song that was then popular. Oh, my Carmen, my little Carmen, something, something, those something nights, and the stars, and the stars, and the cars, and the bars, and the barmen. I kept repeating this automatic stuff and holding her under its special spell, spell because of the garbling, and all the while I was mortally afraid that some act of God might interrupt me, might remove the golden load in the sensation of which all my being seemed concentrated, and this anxiety forced me to work, for the first minute or so, more hastily than was consensual with deliberately modulated enjoyment. The stars that sparkled, and the cars that sparkled, and the barks, and the barkmen, were presently taken over by her. Her voice stole and corrected the tune I had been mutilating. She was musical and apple-sweet. Her legs twitched a little as they lay across my life lap. I struck them. There she lolled in the right-hand right -hand corner, almost as prol Lola, the bobby soxer, devouring her immemorial fruit, singing through its juice, losing her slipper, rubbing the heel of her slipperless foot in its sloppy ankle against the pile of old magazines heaped on my left on the sofa, and every movement she made, every shuffle and ripple, helped me to conceal and to improve the secret system of tactile correspondence between beast and beauty, between my gagged bursting beast and the beauty of her dimpled body in its innocent cotton frock. Under my glancing fingertips, I felt the minute hairs bristle ever so slightly along her shins. I lost myself in the pungent but healthy heat, which like summer haze hung about little haze. Let her stay, let her stay, as she strained to chuck the core of her abolished apple to the fender, her young weight, her shameless innocent shanks and round bottom, shifted in my tense, tortured, surreptitiously laboring lap, and all of a sudden, a mysterious change came over my senses. I entered a plane of being where nothing mattered, save the infusion of joy brewed, brewed within my body. What had begun as a delicious distension of my innermost roots became a glowing tingle which now had reached that state of absolute security, confidence and reliance not found elsewhere in conscious life. With the deep hot sweetness thus established and well on its way to the ultimate convulsion, I felt I could slow down in order to prolong the glow. Lolita had been safely solipsized. The implied sun pulsated in the supplied poplars. We were fantastically and divinely alone. 
I watched her rosy gold dusted beyond the veil of my control delights, unaware of it, alien to it, and the sun was on her lips, and her lips were apparently still forming the words of the Carmen Barman Ditty that no longer reached my consciousness. Everything was now ready. The nerves of pleasure had been laid bare. The corpuscles of cross were entering the face of frenzy. The least pressure would suffice to set all paradise loose. I had ceased to be the hammer the hound, the sad-eyed, the generate cur clasping the boot that would presently kick him away. I was above the tribulations of ridicule, beyond the possibilities of retribution. In my self-made seraglio, I was a radiant and robust Turk, deri deliberately, in the full consciousness of his freedom, postponing the moment of actually enjoying the youngest and frailest of his slaves. Suspended on the brink of that voluptuous abyss, a nice tea of psychological equipoise comparable to certain techniques in the arts, I kept repeating chance words after her. Barman, alarming, my charming, my carmen, hymen, hey 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 as one talking and laughing in his sleep while my happy hand crept up, her sunny leg as far as the shadow of decency allowed. The day before she had collided with the heavy chest in the hall, and look, look, I gasped, look what you've done, what you've done to yourself, ah, look, for there was, I swear, a yellowish violet bruise on her lovely infant thick, which my huge hairy hand massaged and slowly enveloped. And because of her very perfunctory under things, there seemed to be nothing to prevent my muscular thumb from reaching the hot hollow of her groin. Just as you might tickle and cares a jiggling child, just that. And Oh, it's nothing at all, she cried with a sudden shrill note in her voice, and she wiggled, she squirmed, and threw her head back, and her teeth rested on her glistening under lip as she half turned away, and my moaning mouth, gentlemen of the jury, almost reached her bare neck while I crashed out against her left buttock, the last throb of the longest ecstasy man or monster had ever known. Immediately afterward, as if we had been struggling and now my grip had eased, she rolled off the sofa and jumped to her feet, to her foot rather, in order to attend the formidably loud telephone that may have been ringing for ages as far as I were concerned. There she stood and blinked, cheeks aflame, her awry, her eyes passing over me as lightly as they did over the furniture, and as she listened or spoke to her mother, who was telling her to come to lunch with her and at the Chatfields, neither Low nor Hump knew yet what uh, busybody Hayes was plotting. She kept tapping at the edge. She kept tapping the edge of the table with the slipper she held in her hand. Blessed be the Lord, she had noticed nothing. With a handkerchief of multicolored silk on which her listening eyes rested in passing, I wiped the sweat off my forehead and, immersing in a euphoria of release, rearranged my royal robes. She was still at the telephone, haggling with her mother, wanted to be fetched by car, my little Carmen, when, singing louder and louder, I swept up the stairs and set a deluge of streaming water roaring into the tube. At this point, I might as well give the words of that song hit in full, to be to the best of my recollection at least. I don't think I ever had it right. Here goes. Oh, my Carmen, my little Carmen, something, something, those something nights, and the stars, and the cars, and the bars, and the barmen, and oh, my charming, our dreadful fights. And the something town, were so gaily, arm in arm, we went on our final row, and the gang I killed you with, oh my Carmen, the gang I, I'm holding, no. Drew his uh, thirty-two automatic, I guess, and, pull a, and put a bullet through his mole's eye. 